Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon, good evening. I warmly welcome you to the webinar COVID-19 and global vaccine inequality. My name is Martina Neuwirth, and I'm working on international finance and economy issues at the Vienna Institute for International Dialogue and Cooperation, the VIDC. And the VIDC is a quite old think and do tank, as we call it, based in Vienna in Austria. So today's webinar was jointly organized by the VIDC, the Austrian Foundation for Development Research, OFSE, and the Chamber of Labor Vienna. Uh, but before I introduce you to my dear colleagues, Werner and Oliver, uh, let me first also thank my colleagues at the VIDC for helping me organizing this event. And a special thank also goes to Irene buchauk poda uh, from the VIDC, who is our technical support today. Um, uh, Irene, could you turn out on the video just for a second? Hi, <laughs> so that everyone can see her. Hi. Hello. So Irene will support us technically Hi. today. So if you have any need for technical support, just uh, turn to her. I also want to thank the Australian Development Organization, uh, the agency for its financial support of this uh, webinar. And uh, before I turn to Oliver, uh, just uh, a few technical comments. Uh, although this is a webinar and therefore only our distinguished panelists can be seen and heard, I warmly invite you to, for, to uh, post questions and comments in the Q&A section, or in German, it's the F&A, the Frage and Antwort section. Uh, you should be able to find the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please do not uh, use the chat function for posing your questions, because that makes the life of our moderator much easier. Uh, however, please look at the chat from time to time, as we will send you more details about the panelists, and we will also send you useful links in the chat. So have an eye at that, too. Uh, the webinar will also be shown on Facebook, so I also say hi and a warm welcome to our participants on Facebook. And of course, you're also welcome to uh, pose any questions you like uh, via Facebook, and uh, they will be forwarded to the moderator, so they are not lost. The webinar will end at 7 p.m. Uh, before you leave the webinar, I finally ask you to fill out a very short survey to tell us what you liked about the webinar, what you maybe didn't like, and finally, what we could do better next time. So you will also see the link to the survey later on in the chat. So watch out for it. So may, not, may I now first hand over to my colleague, Oliver Krausmüller from the Chamber of Labor, Vienna. Uh, also, uh, Oliver is a trade specialist. He works on international trade issues. Oliver, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'm very thankful that we come together today, one year or more than one year then after the global spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to welcome you on the behalf of the Chamber of Labor Vienna. One important task of AK is to be a strong voice for economic and social justice, and that's what we are heading for today by addressing the global vaccine gap, the global injustice uh, in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. When preparing this webinar with Martina and Werner, we were emphasizing three points. Firstly, to provide orientation, what issues are at stake when it comes to global vaccine inequality and the so-called TRIPS agreement at the WTO at the World Trade Organization. Secondly, to put forward expertise and alternative policy responses to the pandemic and these pending conflicts, especially by learning from and listening to expertise from the Global South, and thirdly, to empower policy action against vaccine inequality and vaccine nationalism. And this, of course, means that we have to strengthen uh, global vaccine justice against uh, the me first approach of richer countries. So recent policy developments make it even more necessary to have this webinar today. Demand, the demands to the patents uh, for COVID-19 treatments at the WTO were once again postponed. 
And in this context, I want to ask you, please stay tuned even beyond this discussion, even beyond this webinar. Uh, there are manifold initiatives for a people's vaccine and uh, uh, global vaccine justice. So please, uh, please stay active beyond the seminar. And let me mention just one example. Um, watch out for the ongoing policy initiatives of the International Trade Union Movement and, uh, of course, in the Austrian context also of ÖGB and the Chamber of Labor of IK. And um, please just have a short, short look on the chat. You will see two or more links on recent initiatives. And against, expect, against this backdrop, I want to thank again for joining us today and I look, I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver. I now want to give the floor to Werner Ratzer. Uh, Werner will moderate the webinar. Uh, Werner is head of the Austrian Foundation for Development Research, ÖFSE, and his research focuses on international trade and development. And Werner now. The screen is yours, so to say. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martina. Uh, thank you also, Oliver. Thanks for the kind introduction and come from my uh, from my, myself. Um, I'm happy to facilitate uh, tonight's discussion um, on, as I think, a very topical uh, issue that is uh, has been, as has been mentioned already, has been for, uh, with us for for quite some time. But nevertheless. Um, the whole issue of vaccine nationalism, of access uh, to, to medical treatments um, is, is of urgent uh, topicality in, in my point of view. So I think the, the whole event today is uh, very much um, um, to um, responding to, to actual problems. Um, and uh, as Oliver has already mentioned, um, we'd like to make a small contribution to advancing the debate um, on these issues in, in the Austrian context, but we also, we, we've also friends and colleagues from um, other European countries mainly uh, participating in, in today's discussion. So I'm very, uh, I'm looking forward uh, to, to our discussion. I'd also like to um, ask all, all the participants to um, join in the debate, ask questions via the Q&A function, um, which we will, we will respond to after our initial um, interventions by our distinguished speakers which I shall shortly uh, introduce to you uh, now. Our first speaker is, is Dr. Carlos Correa. Um, he's the executive director of the South Center. The South Center is based in Geneva. It's an intergovernmental organization uh, with a membership of 54 countries that is uh, working on um, how to uh, promote the interests um, and uh, points of views of um, particularly uh, low-income low income countries before the UN organizations um, in Geneva. So Mr. Correa is very, much, is very close to uh, the discussions that are ongoing at the international organizations um, in Geneva. Previously, he's been working uh, for many years on, on, on international trade uh, policy, international trade law, particularly on the TRIPS agreement, that is on the issue of intellectual property rights. So for those of you who have been working on these issues, he is uh, one of the uh, most uh, um, recognized experts in, in this field. Uh, so we are very happy to have him uh, with us. Our second speaker uh, tonight will be uh, Mrs. Fatima Hassan. Um, Fatima is a human rights lawyer uh, based in the Republic of South Africa. She's uh, the founder and head of the uh, Health Justice, Justice Initiative in South Africa and the former executive director of the Open Society Foundation uh, for South Africa. Uh, Fatima is actively engaged in advocacy work, particularly on access to, to medicines and medical treatment um, in the South African context. So also a uh, warm welcome, uh, welcome to you. Thanks a lot for taking the time um, to join in on, on our debate um, tonight. And Fatima also went, wants, wants me to make um, the announcement and to encourage you to sign the Vaccine Equity Declaration of the World Health Organization. Um, and we'll insert a link to this um, declaration in a few seconds. Um, so after the first two interventions, which shall not exceed more than 20 minutes each, uh, we will then move into a 
uh, discussion um, between the uh, panel speakers, but also uh, with you. So again, I'd like to call on you to ask any questions um, that you deem relevant via the questions and answers um, icon in, in uh, the video conference. Okay, so um, Oliver already uh, laid out a couple of um, the guiding questions for our webinar tonight. Certainly uh, the first thing we want to do is to give an assessment of the current state of access to uh, treatment for COVID-19 or against COVID-19, particularly um, access to vaccines, which is perhaps the most um, urgent uh, issue in this context. Um, and um, it is thus my pleasure to invite Mr. Correa to speak on the current state of affairs in Geneva, particularly as it relates to the discussion in the World Trade Organization on a so-called TRIPS waiver, that means a provision to temporarily suspend the application of uh, IPR rights with respect to uh, COVID uh, treatments, and then also give us his um, you know, uh, view on um, this current state of the debate and uh, probably uh, how it will develop in the near future. As um, Oliver has already mentioned, there is still an ongoing de debate in the WTO on these issues. Um, so um, floor is yours. Uh, Carlos, for your uh, introductory remarks. Thanks a lot again. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Werner, for your kind introduction. Thank you, Martina and Oliver, also for the invitation to participate in this seminar. Let me start by making a reference why um, intellectual property is relevant in the context of COVID-19. I, and I will, will give you just a, a few information about this. Moderna, as you know, is one of the providers of vaccines today. Moderna has declared that they own 240 patents around the vaccines. In fact, Moderna is already facing some disputes on, on some patents, uh, which are owned by another biotech company in the United States. Uh, three patents that have been uh, under dispute with, uh, between Moderna and this company. Pfizer has been sued recently by a biotech company in, in, in Texas, because uh, Firehes has, uh, has been using uh, protein, a fluorescent protein, in trials of its own vaccine that allegedly is infringing the patent of uh, another biotech company. If you look at uh, masks, for instance, you may, you may think that masks are already in the public domain, technology is very well known but uh, around 1,000 patents have been identified in connection with Max. And we may go on, uh, for instance, with some treatment where Remsevir appeared as one potential treatment for, uh, for COVID-19. Uh, of course, Remsevir is under patent in, ma in many countries. The same with Caletra, which was then dismissed, but also many patents are around uh, Caletra. So the fact is that intellectual property is uh, a relevant issue if you want to ensure that uh, vaccines uh, reach uh, everybody uh, in, in all countries. And uh, inter intellectual property may pose an obstacle for uh, further manufacturing and distribution of vaccines in, uh, in relation to COVID-19. It's not only about patents, but as you know, intellectual property covers many areas. The most relevant in the context of COVID-19 are patents, certainly, but also know-how. Trade secrets are also protected as intellectual property without any, any term for protection, a sine die, to the extent that the secret is preserved. Also, copyright may be relevant. Uh, there were some cases in which it has been shown. Design is also relevant in terms of equipment for uh, for resp respiratory, for instance, equipment. So intellectual property may play a significant role in uh, facilitating or creating obstacles for further manufacturing, which is needed, and distribution of vaccines. So why WTO is relevant in, in relation to COVID-19 and intellectual property? So if we go uh, to a little historical review about intellectual property, uh, very brief, so it's interesting to, uh, to see that uh, in the 19th century, intellectual property was uh, subject to the will of uh, each country. For instance, United States, interestingly, 
was not very much interested when it was industrializing in protecting intellectual property in the area of copyright, for instance, the United States, in a deliberate manner, in a very, very deliberate manner, they rejected copyright protection for foreign authors. They only granted protection under copyright to, to nationals with the idea that this would allow the distribution of uh, good, but still cheap books and uh, improve literacy in the country. So they really denied copyright for foreign authors uh, with, a, with a national policy in order to increase literacy. So they also discriminated in terms of access to patent protection. In Europe, interestingly, in many countries did not grant patents for pharmaceuticals until, uh, for instance, the case of France or, or Germany until the 60s. Spain and Portugal only granted patents for pharmaceuticals, including, uh, of course, vaccines and, uh, and medicines in, in 1995. So in Europe, there was also a, a situation which actually started with the French law in 1844 according to which medicines, pharmaceuticals were not patentable. And the very reason for this is that medicines were considered a good, very different from other commodities, which has to do with uh, life and health of people. And therefore uh, in Europe, many countries, as I mentioned, it, did not grant patents for pharmaceuticals. And the same situation was uh, present in uh, many developing countries, including India, Brazil, my own country, Argentina, that followed the French approach. And then did, they did not grant patents for pharmaceuticals. And then this allowed competition to take place and therefore uh, low prices to be available for uh, people in, in those countries. But this changed dramatically uh, when in the context of WTO, a new agreement was uh, established, the so-called TRIPS agreement, the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property, that brought about a paradigm change in relation to the protection of pharmaceutical products. Because this agreement obliged all members of WTO, no more, more than 160 countries, to protect pharmaceutical products under patents, both in terms of the process for manufacturing as well as the products themselves. And this then created a completely different situation under which a, a patent may be exploited during at least 20 years. In some countries, there may, there may be also the possibility of extending beyond 20 years. And this means that during these 20 years, the patent owner is the only one who can manufacture and the only one who can distribute a particular product. And this obviously leads to a monopoly, monopoly situation in which the patent owner is able to charge the prices that the market will bear. Just to give you some examples, in the case of sofosuvir, which is for hepatitis C, in the United States, the cost of one pill of, of sofosuvir has been 1,000 US dollar, while the, the pill can be produced for one or two dollars because the patent was granted there. There is a new and more recent product by a Swiss company. In fact, one single dose cost 2.1 million US dollar. This is for a muscular disease, a genetic muscular disease, and one single dollar cost is 2.1 million. So this is the impact of intellectual property. In the case of COVID-19, this impact is felt in, in particular because of the lack of a willingness of the companies to share the technologies. Although there have been some initiatives, as you may know, for instance, the CTAP was an initiative launched by the president of Costa Rica in order to create a pool under the auspices of the World Organization for the companies to share the technologies and then increase the manufacturing capacity, which is needed. Without increasing manufacturing capacity, it will not be possible to cover the world population and the vaccination during the current year. But then this, this initiative of uh, sharing technologies has had a very negative uh, response on the side of the big pharmaceutical company, the so-called Big Pharma. There has been no transfer of technology. There has been no sharing of technology. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the waiver that was already mentioned by Bernie has been dealt with in the context of WTO. So we, we move then historically from a situation in which there was some freedom for uh, governments to um, decide whether pharmaceutical products were patentable or not, 
to a situation in which if, if you are a member of WTO, most countries do are members of WTO, this option is not uh, there anymore. And therefore the patent owner or the owner of a trade secret, for instance, or copyright may on the basis of the legal monopoly, which is created, actually control the extent to which a particular technology, a design, for instance, is used. And, and this is, is certainly an obstacle for having a, a very, a very strong and concrete action in fighting COVID-19, as it is, of course, the case for other diseases. I will not refer to uh, HIV AIDS, for instance. Um, Fatima, who is the next speaker, knows this case very well. So this the, the, the case in South Africa, when uh, South Africa was suffering so much from uh, the epidemics, not only South Africa, uh, the whole of African countries and other countries were suffering from HIV AIDS. Patents played a major role in, uh, in preventing access to, uh, to cheap treatment um, until, uh, until a fight was, was took place and some, some uh, clarifications were made in the context of WTO. One of these clarifications was important to mention is the so-called Doha Declaration on the Trips Agreement and Public Health, which, uh, which uh, was adopted by the ministers uh, in the WTO ministerial meeting in Doha, which indicates that this, uh, the agreement, the trips agreement should not be an obstacle uh, for access to medicines. In any case, this declaration is, um, is just a, a general statement. And what we, what we need to know is what actually happens in practice. So the trips agreement then established this general rule, pharmaceuticals must be patentable a paradigmatic change as compared to the prior situation. At the same time, the Chiefs Agreement contains some of what we call flexibilities. For instance, compulsory licensing. Compulsory licensing means that a government may grant a third party the authorization to use a patent, even if the patent order does not want to provide this authorization to a third party. That's why this is non-voluntary non or compulsory licensing. So this is something that governments can actually use um, as well as the concept of parallel importation that will allow the importation of a product. For instance, if it's cheaper in, a, in a, another country, you may import that product in your own country, even if uh, there is a patent in, in the territory. So now this, the, the discussion has, uh, has taken place in the context of WTO, more or less on the following terms. In the first place, uh, developed countries, uh, the United States, the European Union, um, Australia, and other countries, I say, well, you know, intellectual property is not at all an obstacle for uh, COVID-19. Um, so there is no evidence for this, and therefore there is nothing to be discussed. If there were an obstacle, and this is the argument specifically by the European Commission, if, if there were an obstacle, you may use compulsory license. And even surprisingly, the Euro European Commission now is arguing for a fast track compulsory license system. And this is interesting because in the past, the European Commission has, has, has opposed those countries that granted compulsory license. For instance, the case of Thailand that granted a number of compulsory licenses, the European Commission was very active against that. More recently, in the case of Colombia, the Colombian government was considered to grant a compulsory license in connection with imatinib, uh, cancer-related uh, cancer drug. And there was a, a strong opposition uh, from developed countries. The United States, for instance, threatened Colombia with uh, not providing support for the post-peace uh, process that for Colombia was very important if they granted the compulsory license. So now some developed countries are saying, uh, if the first place there are no obstacles, if the obstacles arise, you can use compulsory license. But the reality is that when a developing country has attempted to use compulsory license, there have been a lot of pressure, political pressure, economic pressure, threats uh, in order for the countries not to use these, these mechanisms. In addition to this, uh, a compulsory license can be granted by a court. It may be granted by the government or the administration. But uh, it takes time because procedures need to be followed. It is case by case, so you cannot grant uh, compulsory license in general, but you need to identify patents. And in some cases, even difficult to identify patents around a particular vaccine or medicine. A vaccine, for instance, ha has some specific components, but a number of general components, such as adjuvants, 
And there, in some cases, not so easy to identify which patterns may be used in order to block production or distribution or, or, or a vaccine. Thirdly, one problem with uh, the compulsory license is that it can only be granted in relation to patents which have already been granted and not in relation to applications which are still pending. And in the context of the COVID-19, for instance, we, we have seen a number of new applications. NIH, the National Institute of Health of the United States has filed uh, patents in relation to COVID-19 vaccines. Also, um, some research from uh, Israel University has filed. So there are many applications for patents that may also be an obstacle. So that's another issue with compulsory licensing. The fourth issue is that compulsory licenses apply in relation to patents, but not in relation to designs, for instance, which may be needed. It does not apply in relation to trade secrets, which is very important for manufacturing of uh, vaccines. Unlike the manufacturing of chemical products for vaccines, the know-how is very important. And, and Five you cannot minutes, grant. Carlos. Okay, thanks. And you cannot grant, you cannot grant uh, a compulsory license on the same terms as you grant on, on the patent. So, so one, one, one section of the WTO uh, is saying uh, no obstacles. If there were obstacles, you can address these through uh, the so-called flexibility. But then for most developing countries, this is not the right uh, solution because you need to act fast and you need to act together in a collective manner. And this is why a waiver has been submitted by India and South Africa in the context of the, of the WTO rules, which actually allows uh, waivers to be, to be given in exceptional circumstances. Um, so South Africa and India have submitted that there should be a waiver that means that the obligations under the CHIPS agreement in particular regarding the enforcement of patents or the formulas of copyright or design should be suspended during the COVID-19 crisis in order to facilitate an increase in production, the sharing of technologies without the risk of the threat of, uh, of infringement of patents or other rights. So this admission has been made, has had uh, significant support, support from other developing countries. Uh, but still it is opposed by, by developed countries on the arguments I, I did refer uh, before. Um, so now the situation is that uh, still uh, the debate is blocked. There is growing, growing support for this waiver, which does mean suspension. It does not mean to derogate the provision. It, it, it means only to suspend the enforcement of the provision during a period. The period is the COVID-19 situation, only in relation to, to this, to this uh, disease and not in general. So it will not affect the workings or the, the functions of the, of the patent system and other components of intellectual property for other medicines or vaccines, only in connection with the prevention and treatment of, of COVID-19, this waiver will apply. But then the opposition is still, is still goes on. So let's see whether developed countries will come to the, also to the, some uh, reasoning about, this, about, about the need to provide a global solution. Uh, without the global solution, there will be no uh, response, uh, effective response to the COVID-19. But then lastly, one, one question that Bernie has, has uh, requested me to address is what are the options uh, if, the, if the waiver is not adopted? So this is just for two minutes. One option is to invoke a, a provision in the TRIPS agreement is Article 73B that allows uh, members of WTO to take exceptional measures in the case of an international emergency. So this is the so-called national security exception under which a government may, de may decide not to enforce intellectual property rights in order to respond to inter this international emergency. On this, the South Center has published a paper you may be interested in, is the research paper 116 by Professor Abbott from the United States. And that there is there an elaboration on how this, this provision can be used. This may be an option if the waiver is not adopted. And the further question is whether the waiver will be enough. The waiver is not mandatory. So if a waiver is adopted, governments, members of WTO can use it or not. Developed countries, for instance, may opt not to use it, but it may be used by other members. It may be used by developing countries. 
The waiver will mean that no member in WTO could sue, could bring a complaint, another member of WTO because the provision of the trips agreement are not complied with. But this will just give a shield at the international level. Other actions will be necessary at the national level. For instance, in some cases, suspending or amending national laws or changing the national laws. Germany and Canada gave good examples at the very beginning of COVID-19 because they changed the law in order to facilitate the use of compulsory license. This may be necessary. And of course, you may also need to ensure that uh, in order to increase manufacturing capacity, the know-how is, is available. So there will, be, there will be need of international cooperation, including South-South cooperation, cooperation among developing countries in order to make the transfer of know-how, which is necessary to undertake the uh, production at, uh, at scale of, of, of vaccines. Well, thank you very much. I don't know whether I, I exceeded my time, uh, Werner, but uh, of course, if there are no. any questions, I'm, I'm very, I, I'm, I'm certainly ready to, uh, to address them. Well, thank you, um, Carlos, for this first uh, intervention and for giving us this overview on the history of intellectual property rights, which obviously is a very comprehensive topic, which you had to pass through in, in five minutes. Uh, but I think it is important uh, to to understand that the current system that we have at this moment and that was instituted 25 years ago is rather peculiar in historical perspective, given that even in European countries up until the second half of the 20th century, patent protection for pharmaceuticals has been uh, rather the exemption uh, than the norm. So thanks a lot for also giving us the uh, this assessment of the current situation um, in, in Geneva at the WTO. As far as I understand, uh, there will be another discussion uh, on this TRIPS waiver coming up uh, next week and within the, the framework of the so-called TRIPS Council, that is the body within the WTO that is um, dealing with current issues relating to this um, TRIPS uh, agreement. So the, the battle, so to say, is not over, but it is still um, ongoing. Perhaps a, a very quick question to you before we uh, proceed uh, to Fatima. Um, you know, uh, as, 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 as you may have heard, uh, also uh, the participants to this webinar, uh, or you may have read, there is a new director general uh, in the WTO, uh, which is um, um, Mrs. Okonjo uh, Iviala from uh, Nigeria, a former uh, World Bank uh, economist and also um, um, a lady that has been actively engaged in other international fora, including in, in Gavi, which is the Vaccine Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, and she has been proposing what has been termed the third way approach uh, within the organization um, to, with respect to the, the TRIPS waiver and, 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 and the question of how to deal with uh, with COVID-related uh, patents. So perhaps you might want quickly to give us um, your, your impression about this uh, new proposal by the w, w, WTO DG. Well, Werner, this, this uh, third way is a, is a new brand for an old product because in the end she's referring to the use of what I call the three flexibilities, the use of uh, compulsory licensing, or part importation or methods in order to uh, facilitate access to medicine. But she, unfortunately, she has not uh, provided support to the, to the waiver as such. So there was an expectation coming from, uh, from Nigeria, uh, from a developing country, was an expectation that she would uh, more forceful, forcefully um, uh, support the, the waiver that is being uh, now under discussion. So there is no real third way. Uh, what we have is what we have under the CHIPS agreement, these flexibilities that can be used, but with uh, the, the difficulties I have mentioned, um, which th these flexibilities are important, certainly, but in the context of the, of the emergency we are facing, uh, a different approach is needed. Okay, thank you for that quick uh, um, reaction to, to this uh, new proposal that has been introduced into the WTO uh, discussion. Okay, so by way of moving on uh, to, to Fatima, um, um, I'd like to perhaps uh, recall um, also for, for our audience that um, here in Europe, we all too easily forget that access to medicines, uh, which we take perhaps for granted uh, in, in European and other industrialized countries, very much depends not only on financial resources, but also on 
production capacities. Um, and that is something that distinguishes, so to say, uh, Europe um, and other so-called industrialized countries from countries um, in the global south where access to, to medicines is not only hampered by lack of financial resources, but also perhaps by lack of uh, local or regional domestic, uh, manufacturing capacities. And that is um, one of the reasons why this kind of um, this emergency that has um, come up uh, in the context of, of COVID-19 uh, in many countries of the global south, including in, in, in African countries, um, has another dimension uh, since these countries are dependent on, on imported products and, and, and drugs, particularly including vaccines. Uh, which so so access is 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 has has another importance um, uh, than than perhaps uh, in our um, socio-economic context here in the European case. Um, so um, I think against that background, it is very important to look at the situation um, in um, countries of the global south. So we're very happy to have Fatima um, Hassan with us, uh, who's. Um, as I already mentioned in my introductory remarks, um, very actively um, engaged in um, advocacy work in terms of facilitating access to treatments, uh, also including access to vaccines in the current COVID-19 um, pandemic. So uh, Fatima, thanks a lot for, for joining us and we're looking forward to your introductory comments on uh, the situation, particularly in, in the African context. So again, 20 minutes, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Martina, could you share the screen, please, for the slideshow? So hopefully we'll get the slides in a second. Yes. OK, Fatima, please. Great, thank you. Uh, and thanks to Buena and Oliver and Martina, and also just such an honor to be on this panel with, with Carlos. So I just want to take you to some history so that we can understand the context that we're in right now and why vaccine access and equity actually matters. Can I get the next slide, please? So you must remember that our concerns around the conduct of pharmaceutical companies and richer governments is not just something that has occurred in this current pandemic. It's something that we've had to deal with and address also with uh, at the height of the crisis with HIV AIDS. So if we look back to see what happened at the beginning of the century, we had over 40 million people living with HIV. There were ARVs that were available that could have helped you to basically live or to basically have a productive life, but they were very expensive in the region of 10 to $15,000 per person or per patient per year. The ARVs were not available and ARVs are antiretrovirals, which is now considered standard treatment for most people living with HIV in the world. They weren't available then, as Carlos had indicated. They were in some countries in the third world or what we call the global south that had some local production, including Brazil, Thailand and India. And at that time, India also had a very different pathology. They were also the pharmaceutical industry for the global south or for the third world. The, the crisis of death that we were dealing with at that time, and I think that is why it's such a, it's so relevant for the number of people who are getting infected and are getting sick needlessly and dying also with COVID, was in the, at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis. We had about 8,000 people a day dying while life-saving ARVs were actually av uh, available in, in developed countries. In my own country, we were uh, part of the we were trying to address access to ARVs where about 600 people a day were dying at the height of the crisis. Next slide. The previous slide. Yeah. So if we look at the early 2000s and, you know, the point that Carlos is making about the availability of generic versions of certain medications or medicines, and in this case, uh, medicines that we use to treat opportunistic infections or so something like fluconazole, for example, a generic version of it from Thailand at that time cost sort of, you know, just under 30 US cents. But in South Africa, even though we were, you know, uh, a country that had just emerged from apartheid and were sort of becoming a new democracy, 
and we're trying to address some of the apartheid socioeconomic uh, impact in our country, we had to get fluconazole from one company, Pfizer, uh, and that's relevant because Pfizer BioNTech is now one of the key companies that's going to be supplying a vaccine for South Africa. And at that time, we had to pay $8.25 for an opportunistic infection treatment that had we had the ability to access from Thailand, for example, a generic version, we would be paying considerably less. So that's just to give you, you know, an example of the price uh, variations that we were dealing with, where you have a sole supplier that exercises a monopoly, as Carlos has explained, and where you have the ability to use a generic version of the same medicine. Next slide. This is just an indication of what happened because of uh, mainly the challenge to pharmaceutical companies' monopolies, to the demand for them to issue multiple voluntary licenses, and to reduce the prices of ARVs by introducing generic competition and also generic versions of the same ARVs so that you could reduce the price. So if you look at the period from June 2000 to June 2006, and you're looking at your basic first line, you know, uh, mixed regimen of AZT, 3TC, and a very pain, for example, which is, was a standard regimen that was used at that time to treat HIV and AIDS. Uh, you're looking at sort of uh, a, a range of over $10,000 to a generic uh, version of $132. So the, again, the, the ability of countries in the third world to have large scale ARV treatment programs in the early, early 2000s was, uh, made much harder because of the cost of ARVs and because of the way in which these monopolies actually operated to crowd out or to prevent generic competitors or generic versions from actually entering the market. Next slide. So one of the things that we had to do in South Africa, obviously, which is a bit different, was unlike countries that were only dealing with the exercise of monopoly power and the issue of excessive pricing. In South Africa, we also had to deal with two uh, additional factors. The one was we had just come out from apartheid, and so we inherited a private healthcare sector which was mainly at the time for people who were considered white and people who had jobs and people who had medical insurance. And the legacy of that particular system still continues up until today. Uh, so that means that most people in our country, about 80% of our people, who are mostly black Africans, still rely on the public health sector and in the private healthcare sector that deals with about 16% of our people, are mostly people who actually have jobs, who, have, uh, who are employed or who have their own financial means to have uh, financial insurance. So we're actually dealing with the dual healthcare system. Um, so in addition to challenging pharmaceutical companies and their conduct and their pricing and their monopolies and their patents and their you know, uh, various attempts to evergreen patents as well, which is to extend the initial patent protection from 20 years to 30 years or to 40 years and it's what we call gaming the patent system. We also had to deal with the government, which you will remember at that time was in denial about the science of HIV and AIDS and was refusing to make ARVs available to the 80% of people in the public sector. So if you were rich, you could access ARVs in the private healthcare sector in South Africa if you had a few thousand dollars to spare. But if you were poor, or if you only relied on the public health sector, you weren't able to access those ARVs, which is why uh, part of our strategies was also dealing with the pricing of pharmaceutical company um, ARVs in the private sector in South Africa, because that was the only way in which you could access it. It's a bit different now, because the way in which you'll be able to access vaccines in South Africa at the moment is actually going to be through the public health sector. And so I think that's a key difference between our country's response to HIV AIDS and our country's response to COVID. Um, because as you, you know, as, as you may know, South Africa only changed its position after a lot of advocacy, international solidarity and support, and mainly civil disobedience uh, by 2003. And as a result, we now have one of the largest ARV treatment programs in the world. Uh, next slide. Um, I think, you know, I don't want to talk too much about the Doha Declaration, except uh, because Carlos has explained all of this, but to explain that it came within the context of the global battle for access to medicines around the world, struggles that were waged in India and in Brazil, in Thailand, in the EU and in the US in the late 90s and early 2000s actually got us to the point of the Dar Declaration. 
And when we fought for and got the concessions around the Dodd Declaration, which we regard as the flexibilities inherent in traps, you know, we were we were sort of given an undertaking that we would never again have to face a situation where you have a public health emergency or a public health crisis and people can't access a life-saving intervention. And so the Dodd Declaration also, I think, presents for us an opportunity of how do we hold those countries and those companies that are trying to block the waiver, uh, you know, in, in terms of a, a moral argument as well. Next slide, please. So this brings us now to 2020 and 2021 and the idea behind what we call the people's vaccine. Um, given sort of the battles that we had in the HIV AIDS years and given the battles of access as well as premature suffering, as well as premature death, not just in South Africa, but around the world, quite early on when COVID was declared a public health emergency of international concern, as well as a pandemic, uh, various movements emerged in the world. The first was obviously the People's Vaccine Movement, which is a global initiative, which basically argues that everyone everywhere who needs a vaccine must get a safe and effective vaccine seen free of charge at the point of entry. And secondly, that it's not just limited to vaccines, it's that all diagnostic tools, treatments uh, must be available to everyone everywhere free of charge. And so that's linked to the Free the Vaccine campaign as well as the People's Vaccine campaign. And these demands are important because it also links to the TRIPS waiver. Next slide. So you may not be able to see the slide clearly, but the the you know, the historical basis to the people's vaccine movement being born was that quite early on, uh, because of the impact of COVID-19 on the world and the devastating economic crisis it was having, not just, you know, only the public health crisis that it was having, but also the massive socioeconomic uh, impact that it was having on hunger, on starvation levels, on movement of people, on the impact of the economy, on businesses closing down, people losing their jobs. There was an early recognition that a lot of public money and philanthropic support would have to be put into the research of vaccines on an accelerated basis. So this is from the Lancet, gives you an indication of the number of funding from known public sources and not-for-profit funding in terms of US dollars for certain of the front runner vaccine candidates. So for example, AstraZeneca and Oxford University, substantial funding from the UK government, US government, the same with Moderna, uh, the same, for example, with Pfizer, Bio and Tech, which had substantial support from the German government, and then also Johnson & Johnson. So this is important when we come later to the point about the opposition to the waiver as being sort of uh, a waiver that would not enable innovation and that would not enable research and funding. One of the key arguments that we as activists are making is that this is the people's vaccine because actually there's been you know, so much of public investment and support into accelerated vaccine research. And some of these vaccines uh, have actually already received emergency use authorization and are being Uh, used in immunization programs already in multiple countries. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so if we look at the, uh, the maps of where we are in relation to access, the important thing to note is that on the slide that looks at uh, Latin America and North America is having green. That's actually the map of access to vaccines and by when it's estimated according to the Economist Intelligence Unit that most countries will actually have access to the vaccine. So look at the red parts, particularly in Africa and some parts of Asia. And I think that tells you the concerns around the epidemiological risk that we're facing that for the longer it takes to vaccinate the entire world, the greater number of variants you will have and a mutating virus, if you're only going to achieve widespread immunity, you know, uh, in, in, in an entire continent from basically late 2022 or early 23 or 2024. And we'll come to the reasons for that later. 
Next to that is a map of the countries that are actually blocking the TRIPS waiver. And so the irony is when you look at these two maps, you'll see that the countries that have actually secured sufficient supplies for their population, in some cases three, four times, uh, you know, the number of supplies that have supplies from COVAX, have supplies from bilaterals while blocking the TRIPS waiver, have actually started vaccination programs in their country are likely to, to achieve some level of immunity in their own country, but are blocking the ability of other countries to be able to be in that same position uh, by the end of 2021 or even by the end of 2022. Next slide, please. So this just gives you an indication of what we call the bilateral overordering, or what some of us also call the hedging of bets. A number of countries, including the, the, some regional blocks like the European Union, for example, uh, have actually uh, bought up an, you know, multiple amounts of supplies from different vaccine manufacturers in addition to also ordering from COVAX. And in the case of Canada, the EU, the US, Australia, Israel, et cetera, uh, those countries actually pre-ordered the vaccines already by late 2020, even before emergency use authorization was obtained. So basically had bought up the available number of supplies. So in the absence of the ability to scale up manufacturing, there's only so many supplies that you can actually access. And these are the supplies that have been taken up. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, some significant uh, shifts have taken place in the last few weeks because of that map, which indicated that we at a severe crisis point, the WHO has called it a moral catastrophe, that we've basically delayed access to vaccines, which means we've delayed access to vaccination for large parts of the world's population. And so this is why you see the movement that Carlos is talking about in terms of the shift in how people and countries and regional blocks are actually relating to the TRIPS waiver. And so you now have, for example, the African Union, all its member states coming out in support months after South Africa and India actually first led with the TRIPS proposal in October indicating support uh, as at the end of February 2021 for the TRIPS waiver for the duration of the pandemic for certain technologies uh, and only un, you know, up until global herd immunity is, is reached. So not asking for a permanent waiver at all. Next slide. So if we try and answer the question of where are the vaccines is at March 2021, the situation that we're facing, like I said, is one of a crisis uh, point. We've got 75% of the vaccines of available supplies that are already out there administered in 10 wealthier countries. In 130 countries, according to the WHO, there's only been zero or a handful of shots. In my own country, less than 50,000 healthcare workers have been vaccinated through a Johnson & Johnson uh, clinical trial and study. Um, when you say this to people, the usual answer will be, but there's COVAX. And the problem with COVAX, which was meant to be this voluntary mechanism to address equity for low and middle income countries and to share supplies with philanthropic support, as well as some elements of self-financing, is that uh, the, it's, it's a voluntary pooling mechanism. So there's no compulsion on companies to join it or on governments to join it. The Biden administration only joined when he was elected. The Trump administration, for example, didn't want to be part of COVAX. They have a tiered pricing model. So there's three different prices depending on your economic classification. Uh, you've got to be self-financing if you regard it as a middle income country such as South Africa. So we, even though we have an inequality and a hunger crisis and we have an austerity budget at the moment, we actually don't have a lot of money uh, because of a number of reasons, including corruption, we have to self-finance our participation. The high income countries are allowed to participate in COVAX. So in addition to uh, that, that list I showed you of the excess amount of ordering through bilaterals, Canada and the UK, for example, are also now drawing supplies from Co COVAX alongside the bilateral agreement. Um, there's no pricing transparency or contract disclosure. We now aware that there are forfeiture fees uh, and other forms of penalties, but those are not being disclosed. The New York Times is COVAX a big black box uh, because it's not very transparent. Uh, it hasn't as yet raised the full funding target for all low income countries. And this is, I think, the crisis point, which is why the WHO has now actually come out in support of the waiver and is saying that we need to urgently scale up manufacturing capacity through tech transfer. Is that the supply targets and forecasts issued by COVAX, because of the limited supplies available in the global market, cannot cover quarter one needs. 
uh, by the end of quarter one of 2021, it's estimating that it can only cover about 3% of low-income countries' needs, uh, and that by the end of, the, of this year, 2021, it's only likely to cover 27% of vulnerable populations in all low-income countries. And so that is, that is scandalous. I mean, that, that is devastating, which is why the WHO has actually asked for a relaxation of the patent regime, as well as people like Dr. Tony Fauci, the Vatican, the African Union, the UN AIDS, uh, a number of world leaders and authorities will also be speaking on multiple rallies on the 11th of March to mark the one year declaration of the pandemic are saying, we've got to relax the patent regime. We've got to immediately stop the hoarding and start sharing technology. Next. Three minutes, Fatima. Okay. Um, we can talk about the impact that it's had on South Africa um, in the Q&A session, but just to say that given all of this crisis, given our HIV AIDS history, we're at the point where we have still not started a full vaccination program. We have started vaccinating healthcare workers through a study program, which is being supported by Johnson & Johnson called Sasonke. Uh, and we still need to finalize the deals with a number of different suppliers, as well as trying to get supplies from COVAX. Uh, but the, but the uh, curveball around our own vaccination program and the COVAX supplies that were meant to be coming to South Africa is our variant. And that variant has meant that our government has now paused the AstraZeneca rollout, given some of the issues around the data relating to the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine for the South Africa variant. And this is the reason there needs to be a sense of urgency in the world, because the longer it takes to vaccinate you know, everybody around the world, uh, if that's going to take multiple years, you're going to have more variants and you're going to create vaccine resistance even amongst populations that are already vaccinated. So you may get your vaccine in Austria, uh, but that's not necessarily gonna keep you safe and effective if variants are still being discovered in South Africa while uh, you know, millions of people in Africa are not being vaccinated. Next slide. Um, again, we can talk about what's happening in Africa, uh, mainly the mechanism that African countries are now relying on. And for the first time this week, uh, vaccines have now started arriving in a number of African countries. I've lifted that, listed that in the slide. It wasn't like this a few weeks ago where in the whole of Africa, only 25 shots outside of clinical trials had actually been administered. Uh, vaccines have now started in Ghana and Ivory Coast and Kenya and deliveries have been made in some other countries in Africa and others uh, from, from COVID. But like I said, there's a limited supplies, but at least the vaccinations are now starting. Uh, but what's important to note is that the volumes are still relatively small, and that's actually a quote from, from the World Health Organization, who this week acknowledged and recognized that there's a problem with the number of supplies that COVAX can actually realistically provide to Africa and to other low-income countries. Next slide. So, I mean, if, if, if we want to wrap up, I'd like to just take you to the point about uh, the waiver in Doha and this new wave three, which is what we call the WTO way. And the WHO has now come up and said they've got their own way and they're going to be meeting with manufacturing companies this week. So it seems like we have four different ways. What I'd like to actually emphasize is that way one, which is the waiver and way two, which is Doha is actually within the rules of the WTO infrastructure. And so this attempt to try and have this voluntary cooperative kind of way of trying to secure supplies in the middle of a pandemic when we've got an epidemiological crisis on our hands, for us, it's just bizarre. It just doesn't make sense at all. And that's why the demands of health groups around the world are two things, that pharmaceutical companies now really have to share their technological know-how by also joining the WHO CTAPS, which is a voluntary pool technology sharing mechanism, and that governments must stop blocking the attempt to suspend patent rules at the WTO for vaccines and health technologies during the pandemic. We really have to break the, the monopolies. Um, because we've learned from the HIV AIDS crisis that you can't guarantee access if you're only going to rely on benevolence and charity and no transparency. And there's really been a lack of pharmaceutical company transparency, uh, not just in terms of the pricing, but also in relation to the contracts with all of these different companies, as well as COVAX and the AU vaccine acquisition task team. The next slide, which I think is the last slide. Um, yeah, so that's just basically why we're asking for 
really some kind of mobilization around the world to make sure that we don't have a system of vaccine apartheid. Uh, because as you know, even the drug companies have a lot of vested interests. They're in Washington, D.C. They're lobbying many governments not to support the waiver, which I think is a significant thing. And it's similar and brings back, uh, you know, a lot of um, memories around the international pharmaceutical industry suing the Nelson Mandela government in South Africa when similar attempts were made to try and access uh, more affordable ARVs in our country. Next slide. Thank you. Diana, we can't hear you. Oh, okay, sorry. So um, thank you very much, Fatima, for this very interesting um, overview on the history of access to medicines um, in the South African case, which to some of us might be known, but, but I guess uh, to, to many others probably not in, at least not in that uh, level of detail. Okay, so let me remind you that uh, you should, uh, you as participants, ladies and gentlemen, you have um, the opportunity to ask questions by uh, using the Q&A feature of uh, the Zoom program. So please take the opportunity now to ask uh, questions, um, which we will respond uh, to um, each uh, by each. But before we uh, go into the Q&A um, session, perhaps uh, I'd start by um, um, also asking um, a, f a further question um, to Fatima. Um, obviously, um, there is now um, some kind of move movement uh, taking place um, in, sorry. There's some kind of uh, movement taking place now with respect to COVAX, and you've mentioned COVAX, which is the uh, the purchasing program run by the, the, the World Health Organization uh, in cooperation with other organizations, um, and which obviously had a lot of trouble in, in accessing uh, these um, vaccines from the different producers over the last uh, couple of months. But um, uh, finally, some first shipments um, have now arrived in African countries. But nevertheless, um, COVAX is still lacking uh, resources, financial means, and it is still competing with the uh, governments in, in rich countries in terms of uh, making agreements with, uh, with the uh, pharmaceutical uh, producers. So um, when you look at COVAX, um, it seems to me, at least, uh, and that is my personal perspective, that it is the, if you want the in, in the, in the very short term, it is the only game in town, so to say. It's the only mechanism uh, with all its problems and deficiencies that um, has the ability to increase supplies uh, of vaccines for countries uh, in the global south. Um, even if you agree with the TRIPS waiver and even if we support the TRIPS waiver, um, I, my, 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 I would suppose that it will take some time in order to ramp up production, uh, say, by pharmaceutical companies in India and many other countries um, under a free regime of, of access to patents. So in the meantime, it, uh, it's basically COVAX that, that is the, the only mechanism um, to, to, to increase the supply of vaccines to the Global South. Would you agree to that? Uh, you know, opinion, or would you would you also see alternatives, even in the very short term, in order to increase supplies of vaccines in the global south? Yeah, I mean, you know, South Africa has Aspen Pharmacare. It's one of the leading supplier of generic HIV, TB, and malaria drugs, and that's because of the work we did around access to ARVs in the early two thousands. Uh, we also have a state. Uh, you know, public-private partnership company called BioVax, which is pre-selected by COVAX, which was meant to get a manufacturing deal, but didn't. So, so there's two issues. The one is had the companies actually authorized multiple manufacturing licenses by late 2020, we would be in a different situation. 
Uh, but the second is that you could ramp up with a little bit of investment, particularly the manufacturing of mRNA technologies and those kind of vaccines. So the NIH Moderna vaccine is important within the space of a few months. And that's certainly the demand that US activists and groups in the US have been making around the Biden administration to extend the use of the Defense Production Act in the, in the US beyond just the US borders. Uh, but South Africa, for example, Johnson & Johnson has given Aspen Pharmacare a fill and finish license. So there's definitely existing capacity for fill and finishing if these companies would actually, uh, you know, voluntarily or be compelled to do this. And that's why the waiver is important. But if, we, if we're going to have to wait much longer for the waiver, more people are going to die. So in the absence of the waiver, we need our governments to take compulsory measures against drug companies. Uh, and, and, and also to wage a moral campaign against drug companies in the middle of a pandemic, you would still make profit. You still get a royalty on every generic or on every other version of the vaccine you know, that, that you're making. You don't lose your intellectual property uh, monopoly rights in that sense. So you still seem to make a lot of money. Uh, it's just unbelievable that only when the EU had a supply crisis, then you know, AstraZeneca decided to give a license to uh, Novartis and to Sanofi, right, who are usually competitors. Uh, and now Merck is going to be uh, doing fill and finishing for Johnson & Johnson. So when the EU has a supply crisis, then people realize that there's an urgency to find new partners and they found it and they found existing capacity. But when those kind of access issues are happening in the global south, then we get the argument that there's no manufacturing capacity, it will take a long time, that there isn't ability. And so I think there's just a bit of, uh, a bit of you know, evidence that we need to provide uh, and, and also deal with some of the double standards uh, inherent in that. Thanks. Well, yeah, um, you already mentioned the, the, the word double standards. Uh, when you read the press uh, in the last couple of weeks, there's one common argument in terms of uh, opposing um, um, the TRIPS waiver um, and, and, um, and similar measures is that there is not the knowledge base available in many countries of the global south to produce the technologically advanced vaccines on, on, based upon the mRNA technology. Um, so how would, how would you respond to that pledge? So Carlos, do you want to go on the NIH Moderna vaccine or? Well, perhaps you, you could answer that in the case of, of the Republic of South Africa, because as, as you already mentioned, there seem to be manufacturing capacities um, in the country. Yeah. Um, um, so so, um, so I, I, I would say that that's just an incorrect, incorrect characterization of what the situation is on the ground. If there's a political will to actually scale up manufacturing, to share the technology, you could within the space of a few months or even a year, uh, be investing in manufacturing plants that could be producing the mRNA type uh, vaccines. And so that's certainly the argument that's being made in the US that the US government too could actually invest in its own infrastructure and start manufacturing uh, versions of the mRNA, mRNA uh, platform vaccines for countries outside of the US. Like for example, the US did around PEPFAR, where it made a commitment that it would supply ARVs to the whole world. So there's, there's different ways in which you can do it. The problem is that some of the companies who hold on to these technologies have decided two things. They're not coming into our country at all. They're not submitting regulatory dossiers here. They refuse to enter low and middle income countries. They only want to deal with richer nations, but at the same time refuse to allow anybody else in the countries in which they're refusing to enter to actually scale up their own technology through a voluntary license. Uh, and are also blocking any of, uh, you know, kind of efforts at compulsory measures. So there's a certain irony. It's I don't want to come into your market, but I don't want anybody else to help you to make my vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't make sense in the middle of a pandemic when we were promised at the beginning that, that, that there would be a lot of solidarity and where flexibility resides in trips. It's, you know, what we're asking for is actually not empty trips. And I think Carlos can, can speak to that a bit mm -hmm. more. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to to, to, to get Carlos into the discussion again. Um, Carlos, there, there has been um, this, this, I mean, there have been a lot of arguments uh, against the TRIPS waiver, and some of these arguments have involved this kind of double standard arguments uh, that um, countries in the global south um, lack the technological capacity and capabilities to produce these high-tech uh, vaccines that has been um, a commonly labeled um, argument against uh, against the TRIPS waiver. Um, and there have been also arguments in terms of time. Um, 
so that if you want to increase manufacturing capacities in the countries of the global south, that would take a year or longer in terms of establish the manufacturing processes, um, um, transfer the technology, train the people, etc. So what about these arguments? How will you respond to them? Well, in the first place, uh, there is capacity in many developing countries for production of vaccines. You have capacity in Brazil, for instance, in Argentina, in Latin America, also in Cuba. Uh, Cuba has produced uh, important vaccines which have been exported to many other countries. You have also capacity in many Asian countries. There was also already a reference made to capacity in South Africa. So this is not true. And if this were the, the problem, then what is what is the risk of the waiver? If there is no capacity to produce, in any case, there will be nobody using the technologies that could eventually be protected under intellectual property rights. So I think the argument does, does not really is solid at all, because uh, if, if there is no capacity, then the waiver will not be uh, actually used. But the fact is that capacity exists. Also, there is um, a recent study showing that if know-how is transferred, production in the, in the new facility may start between two and six months. So it is not true that you need a full one year. You may need a longer period, of course, if you need to build up a new plant. But if an existing plant can be repurposed in order to produce COVID-19 vaccines, so it will not take as long as it is argued. So it's not, it's not a problem of time. Let me just add something on the COVAX. Uh, Facil was mentioned. Uh, and this is the point that, uh, as you know, COVAX has chosen a portfolio of a few vaccines, all of them from the Western countries. And now many developing countries are dependent on the supply of vaccines from uh, China and Russia. So this is beyond discussion about the efficacy of the vaccines, or so in, in many countries they are already be used, but it's uh, somehow surprising that uh, COVAX has made this maybe geopolitical choice, and they have uh, they have overlooked the possibility of relying on uh, manufacturing. Uh, of course, there is a major, as, as you can imagine, a, a major manufacturing capacity in China, and, and uh, also significant in Russia. And uh, there should be also an explanation why this choice cho cho this choice has been made. And only, um, only COVAX is working with Western vaccine. For instance, Cuba has developed also uh, a vaccine, which may be proved to be uh, effective too, the so-called Soberana. And uh, most probably this vaccine will be excluded from, from the COVAX system. So we need to ask, why is that? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, quick, uh responses to a couple of questions that I have posed. But um, as we've seen, there's also now, now some questions coming in from, uh, from the audience to which I would like uh, to turn uh, now. Um, the first question that has been posed uh, relates to the, the question of why uh, countries are still uh, opposing the TRIPS waiver, the industrialized countries are still opposing the TRIPS waiver given that it is in our common interest to um, have the global population vaccinated at the quickest pace uh, possible. So um, perhaps uh, we could delve once again into, uh, in, into the, the reasons why in the WTO, um, countries like uh, in the European Union or the United States and other countries are opposing that. Could it be that it has to do, and that is my additional question, that uh, the, uh, the vested interests of the pharmaceutical industry um, are afraid that this might be the overture, so to say, the start of a major, you know, attack against the regime as such. And it, uh, I mean, you've been um, emphasizing, both of you, that this is possible. The TRIPS waiver is a legal instrument that is fully compatible with existing WTO law. Uh, but might, might it be the case that there are fears on the part of governments from industrialized countries that uh, given the well-known skepticism of many governments in the global south against the TRIPS regime, um, the waiver is, so to say, an entree, a start into a more profound uh, discussion which calls into question the, 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 the system as such. Might that be one of the reasons? Or what, what is your take on the possible reasons for this um, stiff opposition that we see? 
Anybody who wants to come into that question, yeah, perhaps yeah, Carlos yeah, and then also Fatima. Yeah, but May Vernon, I think you already gave, gave uh, the response to this, the reply to this. Mm -hmm. Certainly, governments of developed countries are very much influenced by the very important lobbying of the big pharmaceutical industry. And most likely, they are afraid of this implication that you have referred to. One of the arguments has been raised in connection with the waiver is that um, intellectual property is crucial for innovation. And if there were no protection for intellectual property, it would not be possible to develop and commercialize the vaccines which are necessary. But if you look at the, at the justification for intellectual property, and this is the common, the common vision of uh, modern economies, these rights, these legal monopolies are granted in order to address what is called a market failure. So the fact that somebody may invest in developing a product, and then if there is immediate competition, it might not be possible to get back the investment made in research and development. But this market failure clearly does not exist in this case. In the first place, because you have a huge demand, you have 7.9 billion people waiting for the demand. If there are two doses, you can count how many, how many doses can be put on the market. And secondly, it was already mentioned, the companies receive the massive subsidies in order to develop and uh, undertake the trials of the vaccines. In the case of Moderna, it's 2.5 billion that were given from taxpayers. So taxpayers in the United States have already paid for the vaccine. And also, as we know, the European Commission and others have provided significant funding. So the market failure argument does not work in the context of COVID-19. So there's no reason whatsoever to keep intellectual property enforcement in, in this context. But uh, you're right, the, 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 the position is not based on, uh, on a rational argument, it's not based on a theoretical, well-supported uh, argument, it's just based on the political weight that uh, this sector, pharmaceutical sector, has and their capacity to influence the decisions of governments in some countries. Okay, thank you, uh, Carlos. Fatima, would you like to weigh in on that? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the public co-owns these vaccines, the NIH co-owns these vaccines, the EU co-owns these vaccines. So the, the argument that there will be no innovation in research on things that are important to the global community is, I think, has shown in the last year that where there's political will in leadership, there will be investment in research. Uh, obviously, there's some diseases where, where there's no investment in research by governments and we need to call them out on it. Um, so, so my approach to this is that we actually co-own these vaccines and you need to take measures because we, it's, it's our vaccines, it's the people's vaccines. So the question is, how did we get to the point within a year of a global pandemic, of a public health emergency of international concern, where the, where the intellectual, intellectual property rights are residing with the drug companies when we actually co-funded and we co-own these vaccines. I mean, my country participated in four clinical trials of the frontrunner vaccine companies, and we were not in the front of the queue for access. So we have all contributed to the scientific knowledge in the last year. It's unprecedented. Government scientists, public institutions, people who worked on Ebola before, people who worked on HIV AIDS before. These were not just private uh, you know, company researchers. So I think there's a, there's a question around uh, how are we in 2021 at the point where we're still treating vaccines and medical technologies as a commodity? And I think that's at the heart of the way that I've written about this in the in foreign policy, that there's an existential crisis uh, that drug companies and some of the richer nations are experiencing. And their fear, I think you're right, it is a fear. Their fear is that if you open the window a little bit in this pandemic on treating vaccines, as a public good, not as a commodity. And then it's very hard to close that particular door. And then we go back to you know, what we had sort of more than 50 years ago, where you actually treated medicines as a public good, it was not subject to intellectual property rules, because that is one of the greatest barriers to access, not just for COVID-19, but also for HIV AIDS and, and, and many other diseases. Um, and, and I think you know, that one slide, which I showed you about the, the Twitter screenshot, where in the US House Committee, the, different CEOs of Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, AstraZeneca were asked, do you support the TRIPS waiver or not? And they all said unequivocally, no, because they are concerned about what happens next and they are concerned about profits. 
And the only thing we can emphasize is that even if you give a manufacturing license to somebody, we, we saw that in our country with HIV AIDS, you can give a manufacturing license, you still earn a royalty. And that is, you know, at the moment happening, somebody asked a question around the different pricing. That's happening with AstraZeneca. They've given two sub licenses to a Korean company and to the Serum Institute of India. And they still, you know, they're not disclosing the full extent of the royalties, but they are earning something on it. And both those companies are charging higher prices for the same vaccine uh, for which you are paying a lower price in the EU and we are paying a higher price in South Africa and Ghana. So something is definitely wrong you know, with the system and, and, and this particular world order. And, and I think that's what people are scared of, that, that this is going to uh, create so much of change within the WTO. And, and, you know, none of us are surprised. Yes, it's the first Black African woman from Nigeria to be heading the, the, the WTO, but none of us expected that she would come out in support of the waiver. I mean, she's talking of a third way, which is exactly what the WTO, uh, you know, expects her to. Th those, that's what the member states expect her to say. Uh, so, so if I understand you correctly, you would confirm this this one question uh, from uh, Mr. Engelitz uh, that there is differential pricing applied by the pharmaceutical companies to the disadvantage of of countries with lower bargaining power, and that is precisely countries in the global south. Yes, and and I think the irony there, just a quick point, is that. You know, we live in a world where multinational companies and richer governments will lecture us in the global south about transparency and accountability. There is no transparency with any of these contracts and there's no transparency on the, on, on the pricing. So if you, if you feel that it was all of your money, it was all of your innovation and you are justified in charging a particular price, make that data available. Let us audit that data to see that you are charging a correct price and that that price is fair. Okay, so um, thank you for that. Um, let's let's see what other questions have emerged, and there there are a couple of other questions now uh, that have been posed. Um, well, there is one question that goes in, 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 into that um, issue that we've raised uh, previously uh, uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of ways of overcoming the current patent regime in the WTO. Um, what kind of um, you know? grassroots uh, uh, movements, what, what kind of other social forces, including perhaps governments in countries of the global south, are in support um, of building alliances in order to push back against uh, the current regime uh, of intellectual property rights protection, not only in the context of COVID, uh, but more generally. Um, so what, what is your um, take on, on, these, on, these, on this issue? Is this something that governments in the global south are actively discussing. Uh, that's also a question perhaps to, to Carlos. Um, um, we know that there is now, just by way of reference, that there is now a discussion on the future of the World Trade Organization. Um, and, and there has been this um, constant criticism from many countries in the global south um, on, on the uh, too restrictive um, legal framework um, with, with, with regard to intellectual property rights protection. So. Uh, yeah, perhaps you, you could come in on these on this question. Who would okay, like to well, start, Carlos, perhaps? <clears throat> yeah, all right. Well, thank you for the question. J just to, uh, to make an introduction to, uh, to reply, at the UN, the Secretary General of the United Nations in April last year made a statement arguing that uh, vaccines and other products for COVID-19 should be treated as global public goods. And this terminology, in fact, was used at the World Health Assembly in September, where uh, President Macron, for instance, uh, from France, he mentioned the need to ensure universal access. The concept of global public good was used by President of China, by the Chancellor of uh, Germany. So there was, at one point, uh, the idea that uh, at, the, at the high political level, many heads of states actually participated at the World Health Assembly that we should move towards this idea of dealing with COVID-19 products as global public goods. But this, this has not actually uh, materialized as we are right disc disc discussing right now because of the fact that uh, technologies are appropriated under intellectual property rights. So this discussion took place, for instance, also at the UN General Assembly and if you look at the resolutions that were adopted at the UN General Assembly in connection to COVID-19, 
the concept of global public good is retained, but it is referred to the immunization. Immunization is the global public good. It's not the tool to immunize, to immunize but the immunization as such is, is considered to be the global public good. And of course, this is, is twisting the concept. This is not what we needed, but uh, recognition that in this international emergency, but exceptional circumstances, you actually, actually needed to, um, to work on a different frame. So whether there is a, a movement to, um, to change the regime in intellectual property in the concept of WTO, I wouldn't say this is the case today. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, the number of uh, developing countries uh, have made at least formal proposals or suggestions to abolish the system. So what they're looking for is to have the possibility of mitigating the negative impact of the system when circumstances arise. Of course, for many of them, it will be a, a good objective to uh, change some of the rules, which are, as you mentioned, too rigid. Uh, in terms of uh, protecting the, the rights of uh, the of patents and other fields. But this has not actually been proposed. So maybe, maybe one situation that may arise if the waiver is not accepted or other tools to mitigate the impact of intellectual property is, is not su subject to a consensus uh, and a solution. So maybe in the future, you may have this reaction. So if it is not possible to work under, under the system, we, we need to change the system as such. So this may happen in the future. And then maybe the civil society may play a role in, in clarifying uh, what the current issues are and uh, making it, uh, making the point, if it is not possible, then to work within the system to mitigate the negative impacts, there is a need to change it. Okay, well, thank you for, for that response. Uh, Fatima, would you like to join um, and also give a comment on this issue of uh, ways to overcome or potentially to overcome the current IPR system and the, the current state of the debate? I mean, do you have any, any knowledge about um, African governments, for example, uh, discussing this issue? Yeah, so the, in, in the presentation that I did, I indicated that the AU, the African Union and, and all its member states has now come out fully in support of the TRIPS waiver, uh, given the crisis that, that we're facing in Africa. We've got now 57 co-sponsors on the TRIPS waiver proposal. You know, that was not the case. South Africa and India are leading it. I mean, the irony is, is Brazil, that the Brazilian government, even though they are a BRICS trade partner of South Africa, is not supporting the waiver. That is unusual because Brazil and South Africa were, were very close politically and in terms of the HIV AIDS solidarity, in terms of providing access to ARVs, Brazil was a key sort of supporter and partner to South Africa. But two interesting, things have happened, two interesting things have happened in the last few weeks. The one was in the EU. When you had the supply crisis, the relationship between the EU and pharmaceutical companies changed and altered. Uh, and it links to the relationship the Netherlands had with Roche, for example, early on in the pandemic around threatening them with compulsory licensing on some of the diagnostic tests. And you saw an about turn of, of companies. So it's a very interesting thing playing out in the EU that it seems that the EU supply crisis may have actually helped with sort of exerting more pressure on pharmaceutical companies. The unfortunate thing is that the EU responded with an export ban and some of our countries are now on the ban list. So you may have got additional manufacturing licenses, but, but those supplies are then only for the EU. And so it's a different form of vaccine nationalism and can't leave the country. While that you know, crisis was playing out between the EU and AstraZeneca and EU and some of the other companies who haven't quite fully committed to uh, honoring the, the supplies that they said that, that they would provide to the EU in the US, um, the US pharmaceutical industry, who are really vehemently opposed to the TRIPS waiver, made their annual submission to the US uh, you know, Trade uh, Office representative. And in their submission, basically, and you can find it on KEI, uh, Knowledge Ecology International, on their website, in that submission, they condemn the WHO, they condemn UNAIDS, they condemn UNICEF, they condemn every single organization that has actually called for a relaxation of the patent regime. So I think the stakes are quite high and they've asked for the US uh, government to take action against certain of these uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, multilateral bodies there. You know, and you'll remember in the HIV AIDS years, we were put on the Clinton trade watch list for, for saying that we would pass a law that would allow parallel imports and that would apply, uh, you know, that would allow generic versions of ARVs coming into our country. And that's when the pharmaceutical industry sued Nelson Mandela. So, so the stakes are quite high, but I think that the, the stakes for us are particularly high within the US pharmaceutical group because something has definitely shifted within the EU. Somebody asked a question about support in other parts of the world. C civil society in Japan do not necessarily support their government's opposition of the waiver. There are groups that are mobilizing in New Zealand who are saying to the New Zealand government, you cannot sit on the fence any longer. You've got to support the waiver. Uh, so I think that, that you know, the concern around what is happening around the world is almost a reminiscence of the early 2000s around the HIV AIDS struggle that a lot more people are realizing the impact, like Carla said, uh, of the way in which the trade regime is actually working to undermine access to public health and widespread immunity and that may um, you know cause some change in this week because as you know the negotiations are again on uh, Wednesday and Thursday uh, and, and who knows it may lead to you know some kind of uh, additional concessions or additional manufacturing licenses we saw that in South Africa when you threaten compulsory measures and when you challenge companies on their pricing and ask for pricing transparency that's when companies respond and issue multiple voluntary licenses. That, I mean, that's how we got ARVs into our country. Yeah, perhaps we'd like, uh, we, we, we elaborate a little bit on that, Fatima, because it seems to me that uh, there's a lot of civil society activism and social movement activism going on um, in, say, in, in African countries or in other countries. Um, but it seems to me that although we do have a discussion on vaccine nationalism in, in the European context, for example, um, mobilization from civil society and grassroots uh, on the issue of, if you want, international solidarity towards uh, equal access to vaccines um, is rather lacking or perhaps in a very early phase. So perhaps you could uh, also e elaborate a little bit on what you see in terms of civil society dynamics on an international level going on, whether you see a, a wave of organization uh, going through civil society in different countries and how how, how at, at which stage so to say we are in in, in this in this yeah. process thanks so so there's definitely a great effort being made at global solidarity and mobilization and i think on a much faster basis and at a much faster pace than we ever had with HIV AIDS because I think the consequences of pandemic is a mutating virus and a fast moving virus is, is much more severe in that sense and the immediacy is much more real. So there's groups, for example, this week that are planning a number of global actions around the TRIPS waiver and around vaccine equity, uh, which is being led through Global Justice Now in the UK. MSF Access Campaign has been doing a lot of work, particularly in Europe, especially with the French government, Italian government, as well as the uh, governments in the UK, in Germany and uh, in Belgium as well. Um, there's also Amnesty International, uh, Oxfam that has been, and Human Rights Watch that has been documenting the pernicious form of vaccine nationalism that is now emerging and I really would urge people to, to look at their work and to support them. And then obviously, you know, groups like Third World Network, um, uh, Public Service International, a number of trade unions and worker-led formations and movements, uh, particularly workers in informal settings, uh, refugee and migrant organizations are all now mobilizing because people finally realize firsthand what the impact of not having vaccine access is, is, is going to be. It's a very different situation to what we were seeing in November of last year, when the vaccination started in the UK and in the US towards Christmas. I think that's when we saw sort of a ramped up mobilization among civil society players and actors, because the concern was we're not going to wait. We don't want to wait years again, like we did with HIV AIDS. Unfortunately, the reality now is that in the absence of technology transfer and sharing of vaccine know-how, there's limited supplies, and we are going to actually have to wait, you know, a couple of years before we can get widespread immunity in our regions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any new questions uh, on our Q&A list, so perhaps... Um, let me turn to this uh, to one of the questions um, that has been also highlighted uh, by by others uh, in the audience, and that relates to, if you want, the, the geopolitical 
dimension of, of this whole uh, debate um, that uh, on the one hand it seems to me that we are living through a severe crisis of, of uh, global cooperation where COVAX Co is not working properly, um, the WTO is not living up to its commitment to stick to its own rules uh, because of the resistance of rich countries. Uh, so what we see in a way is, is a continuation, if not deepening, of, of the crisis of um, you know, global cooperation. While on the other hand, we see that uh, countries like Russia and in particular China um, you know, providing a certain amount of support, uh, at least uh, in terms of also uh, providing uh, vaccines uh, and other treatments to countries in the global south. So, uh, Carlos, would you see that uh, this crisis is, is in a way, um, you know, perhaps um, a point of um, that, that opens up alternative venues also in terms of uh, the trajectory for international cooperation uh, in the future? Um, and would you see uh, something like a renewed sense of, say, solidarity between countries in the global south in terms of promoting forms of South-South cooperation. So it seemed to be that perhaps 20 years ago, we've seen a certain wave of South-South cooperation, which has then ebbed, but perhaps might reemerge uh, as a consequence of this, uh, you know, in, uh, incredible form of, of um, lack of solidarity uh, from Europe and other OECD countries. Yeah, that, that's correct. But in fact, uh, South South cooperation has increased a lot to do in the last 20 years. So it has not gone down, but uh, it has expanded in scope, has expanded in activities. There was a conference in, in Buenos Aires called BAPA Plus Forte, in which there was a, a, an examination of the way in which South South cooperation had actually boomed during the last uh, year. So South South cooperation is, is very dynamic is covering many areas, but as you are suggesting, it's also now uh, proving that it's important in the context of uh, a pandemic like this. And in fact, this is uh, taking place um, and may, may also provide a boost to more uh, social cooperation. So interestingly, when this, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic started in the UN assembly, there were discussions and there were, uh, as I mentioned, at least a couple of resolutions that emphasized the need for, for international solidarity. But international solidarity does not need to be proclaimed only, it needs to be practiced. As you are suggesting now, what we see in, in many developed countries in the European Union, the United States, etc., is what uh, has been called this uh, vaccine nationalism and not the solidarity. Uh, the, the COVAX is also an example. So the ambition of the work organization through COVAX was to ensure that at least 20% of the population of all countries could get the vac vaccination as soon as possible. But COVAX today, in the absence of a real multilateral system that supports this action, is really competing with the governments which are making bilateral agreements with the companies whether in China, Russia, Moderna, whatever, in order to get vaccines. So all governments are des desperate because there is a, a lot of public pressure to get vaccines. Then you have COVAX competing with others just to get a few months of, of, of doses. So this, is, this means that the international solidarity has, has failed. We didn't get that. And then as you were suggesting, this, this could be a, a good example in which you may have a strengthened South-South cooperation. And this may happen to the extent that uh, more facilities are, are establishing, for instance, Brazil, Brazil has announced a, a big plan for production of, of vaccines, that some facilities, facilities are repurposed. So you will see most likely more South-South cooperation to the extent, for instance, that the Cuban vaccine is also approved. Cuban has a very good record in biotechnology, in production of vaccines. So to the extent that this vaccine is also finally under, now it's still under trial, but is finally approved, then it will, it will also offer an opportunity for social cooperation. So my reply is yes, this will open more uh, for social cooperation in the future. Okay, thank you, Carlos, for that. Uh, 
there has been a new question, as I see now, posed, uh, particularly um, addressing um, Fatima. Um, regarding the idea of a vaccine as a common good, do you see intellectual property rights as the key obstacle? Um, other than national governments and large NGOs, who would be potential actors for such a fight? Um, and the person that is asking, Mr. Brian Dane, is a trade unionist. So he's obviously coming from trade unionism. Um, and that's actually, I think, a quite, quite interesting um, question because it points to the role of um, if you want um, civil society in terms of also proposing alternatives to the current uh, IPR protection system. So would you like to respond to that, Fatima? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that's a great question. And like HIV AIDS, intellectual property and the exercise of patent monopolies in this pandemic, because we're not recognizing vaccines as a public good. So we're saying we want to treat it as a public good, but it's not being treated as a public good within the WTO system is one of the greatest obstacles. So right now, the inability to scale up manufacturing and to get more supplies to the rest of the global South is totally dependent on whether drug companies voluntarily out of the goodness of their heart give you multiple voluntary licenses or whether you compel them to do that through compulsory measures to scale up, which could be through the waiver or if governments in each individual country uh, use the TRIPS flexibilities to actually take compulsory measures, which what we, is what we call compulsory licensing. But like Carlos said in his introduction, it's hardly ever used. It's rarely invoked. It's very difficult to use. And then you get subject to a number of legal battles in your own individual country, which is why you know, the waiver was requested. So I think that trade unions play a significant role in this particular struggle all of the different uh, faith-based organizations. I mean, the Vatican coming out and saying that patents should be relaxed, that they support the TRIPS waiver, that we need manufacturing scale up. The Archbishop uh, of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa has written to the Biden administration to say, we need your help. You need to scale up manufacturing on particularly the NIH and the Johnson & Johnson, the NIH Moderna and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, I think is significant. So faith-based organizations, trade unions, civil society, um, and, and all the people on the front line in South Africa, the mobilization is happening, not just with nurses and healthcare workers, but teachers, with security guards, with policemen and policewomen, the people who are actually putting their lives on the line uh, in order for people to open up the economy, uh, who are themselves at risk because they're not getting vaccinated. So I think that there's a lot of support and there's a lot of solidarity and buy-in much sooner than what we saw in HIV AIDS. In HIV AIDS, we had a long period where the public didn't understand why intellectual property was a barrier and they, you know, they felt, well, just pay the price and it's not really the, you know, the key obstacle. But with COVID, I think we're seeing something very different. Um, if I can just talk about the point about South-South, and I think that's where new interesting partnerships are being created, right? Because um, you would expect that if you're part of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, that the Brazilian government would support the South African government. It's not. It's, it's totally doing its own thing. But civil society in Brazil is working with civil society in India, in, in South Africa, in other parts of, uh, in Kenya, for example, to try and increase access, not just for Latin America, but also for Africa, which is a key principle of, of solidarity. Carla's point about the preference for Western vaccine, I think, is an important one. Uh, it's only now in the last few weeks that the South African government has said that the Russians are in conversation with the South African government and that the reason why the conversation could not happen sooner was because Sputnik did not submit their data earlier and was not willing to release their data earlier. It now has, and the data looks very promising. It could be that South Africa and many parts or members of the AU, because we're struggling to get supplies from COVAX, uh, which you know can't, can't meet all of the AU's demands, could actually use the Russian vaccine if the South African regulator feels that Sputnik is actually a good vaccine to use. In relation to China, both Sinopharm and Sinovac have not submitted their data to any regulators that we know about in the AU. And so that means South Africa has actually put that on hold. They've had conversations with them, but South Africa, for example, has a really stringent regulator. They will not approve a vaccine without all of the data. In fact, there's not a single vaccine has been approved for broader non-study use in South Africa as yet because they're still looking at all of the data uh, and because we have variants. So I think it's going to be quite interesting because a number of the um, 
uh, like the UAE, for example, none of the Arab countries and some other countries that started vaccinating over Christmas and New Year, when we looked into where they were getting their supplies from, it was actually China. And that's the vaccine that was being offered. What we're seeing in the UK and in some parts of the EU is that the public are saying, I don't want that vaccine, I want this vaccine. And so you also have this, uh, you know, something that is unfolding where some parts of your population will say, I want a Western vaccine, and some parts will say, I want a Russian vaccine. And so how do you as a health authority manage all of that, I think is going to be quite interesting. And interesting then uh, for how is, uh, you know, the WHODG, uh, when they're calling for the CTAP uh, to actually be fully functional, going to deal with the fact that there are other technologies that are available, as Carlos indicates, and, and why do we only have a preference for, for some of them? Uh, linked to the fact that some of those companies are actually not even joining COVAX. So as far as we know, Moderna has indicated an expression of interest to join COVAX, but hasn't as yet. Uh, and we still have to see whether Russia and China uh, will more fully. Perhaps let me ask one additional question with respect to the specific role uh, that India uh, has been playing in, uh, in, in this discussion. Um, as we know, India has been one of the co-sponsors of the TRIPS waiver in the WTO. Um, on the other hand, um, if you follow the, the international press, um, you might have read that the Indian government has ordered the Serum Institute of India to uh, privilege supplying uh, local the local or the national constituency, um, um, and, and, and thus has indirectly, at least, uh, restricted exports of, of uh, vaccines produced by the Serum, Serum Institute to, to other countries. And that seems, to me at least, to be particularly problematic given the, the large manufacturing capacities that India has uh, in terms of vaccine production. Um, so how would you assess uh, the, the political position uh, of India in, in that discussion. Perhaps Fatima and then Carlos, very shortly. You have to un unmute. Sorry. So, so the India example is quite interesting. Uh, I'll just give you some background on that. We, India is part of BRICS with, with South Africa. They're co-sponsoring the, the TRIPS waiver proposal. We get to January 2021 and we have no vaccine supplies, South Africa. Uh, and the only way in which we get vaccine supplies when the country is basically saying to government, what have you done? You haven't you know, ordered any supplies. Other countries are getting vaccinated, been delayed. Is that the African government negotiates a deal with the Serum Institute of India where it secures 1.5 million dosages of the AstraZeneca vaccine because AstraZeneca and Oxford University have given a license to Serum where serum has to deal with some middle income and low income countries. So we can't buy directly from AstraZeneca because they've given the license to serum. At that point, uh, the government of India says there's an export ban, like the ban that the EU now has in place and that no supplies can actually leave South Africa. Because of our trade relationship and the long history of India and South Africa, we believe that the president of South Africa called the prime minister of India and said, you have to relieve some supplies. So within 24 hours, the ban that was initially reported on was then lifted and those supplies actually came to South Africa. The, the irony of that is we've now paused that entire batch because of the variant and the data around the AstraZeneca vaccine. Mm -hmm. Those vaccines are now going to be sold to the AU. That's just been confirmed in the last 72 hours that our government that fought so hard with the Indian government to get the vaccines here will now be selling that to the AU in places where they don't maybe have that variant. Uh, so we are also at the moment getting different stories and it's not very clear about whether there's an informal ban or whether there's a formal ban or whether the ban has actually been lifted uh, beyond what we had initially been told a few weeks ago. And just yesterday we heard that COVAX has actually delivered supplies to India. And, you know, a, a key part, so there's an irony there because India has so much manufacturing capacity that some of COVAX supplies are actually going to India. Um, and we must remember that COVAX key pillar, key vaccine pillar is actually the AstraZeneca vaccine. If it can't be used in countries where there is the variant, for example, it's been paused in South Africa, 
then a, a number of countries that were depending on COVAX for the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, you're going to have a problem. And so the issue is what are we going to do with the 2.9 million AstraZeneca vaccines that were promised to us by COVAX when there's only 170,000 coming from COVAX of the Pfizer vaccine. And so the, the issue around COVAX and its transparency, can you give vaccines back? Can you sell it? Can you swap it? Can you barter? Uh, I think th this is you know, going to be the situation uh, going forward in the next 12 months. Okay, thank you, uh, Fatima. Um, well, Carlos, would you, would you have something to add um, on the role of India in this whole uh, debate? Just to add that India has also developed its uh, own vaccines. Uh, India has also made donations to the neighboring countries. This is, this is informed in different reports. So India is providing particular, some particular countries with uh, doses of vaccines. Um, this is a very delicate issue indeed, because if you have 1.3 billion people and if I'm manufacturing capacity, so balance the national interest uh, and the international uh, interest. So it's not, a, it's not a very easy decision. Just to get 20% uh, of the population of India vaccinated, you will need 260 billion million people uh, vaccinated. Uh, to success, sorry, to success, 260 million people vaccinated. So um, I think you need to recognize that these are complex issues. The government's under the pressure. I think the main problem is that governments have not had the bargaining capacity with the companies in order to force them, for instance, in the contracts that we don't know they have signed to uh, make a distribution of vaccines, which is does not, does not mean that there is such a the capacity for developed countries to purchase or pre-purchase vaccines and then get, as was mentioned, a number of uh, doses which exceeds uh, three, four times what is actually needed. So I think that this, this bargaining asymmetry between governments and, and uh, companies is one of the major issues that we need to look at and, uh, and take the measures to avoid that this happens again in the future. Okay, well, um, we are shortly running out of time, so I'd suggest that we um, now wrap up um, our discussion um, before we then um, 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 well, close uh, the webinar. So uh, in terms of giving, giving both of our speakers a chance for a final statement, um, um, I think it is very important that, uh, that we recognize uh, that this, uh, issue will stay uh, with us for, for the next uh, couple of years um, and uh, that we need probably both a, if you want, um, a short-term strategy of how to handle with the current situation and how to manage, uh, but also that, uh, and that is also important, I think, uh, from, a, from, from the perspective of um, um, you know, a longer-term um, um, approach, that we also uh, develop, if you want, a strategic outlook uh, um, in terms of what can uh, civil society do to support broader access uh, to medical treatments and medicines um, in not only in the global south, but perhaps on a global basis, if you want. So I'd like to ask you, uh, both of you, uh, to perhaps comment on uh, what you see as the, the short-term immediate challenges uh, for the next couple of weeks and months, and what you would think is should be prioritized in terms of uh, working towards a more profound alternative to the, the current system of production and distribution and access to, uh, to medicines and medical products, uh, and where you would um, see the priorities that, that civil society should uh, work on in this longer term strategic um, outlook. So short-term uh, outlook and long-term strategic approach, that, that would be my final uh, question to both of you. Uh, and I'd like to ask you to be uh, rather short, so perhaps uh, confine yourself to, to a three minute um, final statement to wrap up our discussion. Okay, so uh, perhaps um, Carlos will start and then Fatima. Yeah, okay. Well, I then perhaps if I only have three minutes, I would like to focus on the long term. Okay. The short term is just to solve these problems, this uh, competition mm -hmm. uh, among uh, COVAX and the governments, these bilateralism instead of multilateralism that we need to face. 
But in terms of long terms, I think there are at least three, three areas in which there is a need to take action. The first one is to uh, enhance the capacity of the World Health Organization to act uh, as a real multilateral organization with the power to, uh, to make decisions. For instance, one of the problems we're seeing with COVAX is because there is not a multilateral, multilateral governance of COVAX. It is just another, another entity, coalition, in fact, of entities trying to do something without the multilateral support. So I think one important thing for a long term is to uh, increase the capacity of the World Health Organization to act as the global public agency. The second one is uh, the model for research and development. So this crisis has shown that the, the world population, in particular in developing countries, cannot depend on the activities undertaken on a profit basis. So there is a need to move towards a different model for research and development under which uh, whatever innovation is produced uh, is considered really a global public good. So now any innovation which is produced is privatized, is appropriated. So we need to move to a, to a model in which public health needs are actually the priorities for research and development. This is not necessarily the case today. And secondly, we ensure that there is not only innovation. Innovation per se is not the goal, it's innovation plus access. And you can get this if there is a real change in the paradigm in the way in which research and development is conducted. And the third one is increasing capacity for manufacturing in developing countries. Well, it is interesting, maybe it's ironical that the European Union found that they had very little manufacturing capacity in pharmaceuticals. They were very much dependent on medicines produced in China and India. And that's why the European Commission itself has started some, some movements in order to increase the local manufacturing capacity within the European Union. But we also need to ensure that this happens in developing countries. Developing countries have, in, in many cases, the scientific technological capacity of course, there is a need to provide the necessary investments and to push for the development of the pharmaceutical industry, including vaccines in, in the developing world as well. Okay, thank you, Carlos, for these very the three very important points, which I would fully sub subscribe to. So, Fatima, you have the final word in wrapping up our discussion tonight. Thanks. So, firstly, we've got to treat the vaccine as a public good. And so you've got to make sure that your politicians and your governments do that, not just saying that they're going to regard it as a public good, but actually treat it as one. We've got to vaccinate all healthcare workers around the world in the first 100 days of 2021. That's a call by the WHO. And so we need to donate access supplies or divert supplies so that all healthcare workers actually get vaccinated. Uh, Carlos has mentioned we need to ramp up and urgently scale up manufacturing through either multiple voluntary licenses or compelling companies to transfer technology and vaccine know-how. In the absence of that, we're basically going to take years before we can actually get back to any kind of normality. Um, there won't be widespread uh, you know, uh, immunity, which will have other public health crises and impact on our health systems. And ask your governments and your politicians and your opposition parties to create enough pressure to support the waiver to not enforce patents in the pandemic, uh, because you actually co-own these vaccines. A lot of this money actually came from EU member states. So you have a right to demand that uh, the vaccine is actually shared and it becomes a true people's vaccine. Thank you. Well, thank you, Fatima. Thank you to, to you and also to Carlos for two very... Uh interesting um, interventions and a very lively discussion that we've had. Um, I think um, this whole issue is, is of utmost importance uh, for all of us. So um, I very much hope that with this discussion, we could give a little bit of an impetus uh, to stimulate a discussion and also action, um, civil society action on, on these issues here um, in, in Austria, uh, in the middle of Europe. Let me also thank you, uh, dear participants, colleagues and friends for um, attending uh, our, our webinar tonight. Uh, please, if you have not done so, uh, please also fill in the, the survey, the feedback survey. The link has been given to you via the chat function. So we'd, we'd be happy to receive your feedback. Uh, thanks also from my side to uh, the co-organizers of uh, tonight's event, uh, the Vienna Inter Inter Institute for 
uh, de uh, International Development and, and uh, Cooperation and uh, the Chamber of Labor. Um, so have a very nice um, evening uh, and um, please stay tuned on, on this issue and follow us um, on uh, what uh, um, actions and, and, and advocacy work and other uh, work is, is forthcoming from our organizations uh, on these issues and follow particularly the work of Carlos Correa and Fatima Hassan, uh, who are very much at the front line uh, the, of uh, the international uh, work on uh, access to um, medicines. So thanks a lot and have a good evening. Thank you very much to our speakers. Well, thank you, Juan, again. Huh? Thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye.